There's a lot here. And it's not pretty. And it's sad because it's true. Enter the stylist that likes to share. Here is Amber with knowledge and care. And if you like the vibe, like and subscribe. So this little girl from the middle of nowhere, Michigan, grew up to be a nice little young fashionista, thanks to all her fabulous friends, always inspiring her. And also, uh, cosmetology school was amazing. I had a, an amazing teacher, and I was lucky enough to graduate the top of my class. I was also lucky enough to end up at a really great salon that helped me learn and grow and thrive along with a lot of other great friends and family who have done more than I could ever. Oh, I'm going to start crying. <laughs> they have done more than I could ever say thank you for. And if you're not in this video, it's not because I don't love you. It's just because I can't go on and on. And as lucky as I have been, there has been many that have not been as lucky. While I lived my best life as a cosmetologist and then went on to teaching, I was really sad to find out that teaching was just not quite what I thought it was. The schools are not the same as what they were when I went to school, or at least not the one I went to, and I don't know that there's one out there that's suited for me. I really wish you know, I could find something, but I think the next step would be maybe opening my own school or just really promoting apprenticeship. So uh, this is the website I found and I'm going to go over it a little bit today. It's a lot here, so I can't go into full detail, but we'll see how this video does. And if we want to do more to go even more in depth with all the juicy tea that this website has to spill uh, just let me know in the comments below and I will get deeper into all of this if um, there's people out there interested I know I don't have a ton of people following me but if you're so inclined please follow me and uh, go back and watch my own videos to see the journey I've been on since uh, dropping out of beauty school and becoming a beauty school dropout uh, just uh, bringing my knowledge to the masses on YouTube Hope you enjoyed this video today and uh, thank you for watching. So as a professional cosmetologist in the industry for almost two decades and as an educator in the industry for about four years, I think I have a unique perspective on the industry as a whole from step back, you know, as an educator, but also as a professional in the industry and not only as a hairstylist, but as a makeup artist, as somebody who has gone out of my way to actively pursue many different avenues of this industry. So I could have a very diverse perspective. Also, I wanna um, ask my fellow professionals how they feel about this, because I think uh, to move forward in a more positive way to actually let artists that are passionate bloom and become successful. We need to all examine this um, dilemma <laughs> in our industry and do better to actually educate and inspire the next generation of professionals in this industry. That's what I want to do and that's what I aspire to do and it broke my heart to find out that the school setting is <laughs> not the place to um, do that. It's actually a very sad place with lots of very um, broken systems that are perpetuating a lot of unethical and bad behavior in our industry. And it makes me really sad because my educator was so passionate about this industry being of the utmost highest standards and holding ourselves to those high standards and only accepting excellence from ourselves and our coworkers, regulating ourselves in this industry. I didn't realize how much of what she taught us was rare, that it was um, not necessarily 
commonplace for schools to teach that level of professionalism, that some schools actually are promoting types of salons that prey on young stylists that underpay and overwork young stylists and just have this perpetual incoming flow of young stylists that get burnt out, that leave the industry. And so there's new stylists that are willing to take those low paying jobs, work too much because they're getting fed this false narrative of, you know, if you work hard, then you're gonna become this, this and that and the other. And then they work their little buns off, get overworked and then they are burnt out and broken hearted and they move on with a bunch of debt or they or their parents paid you know up front that twenty forty thousand dollars for their education or they took out student loans so now they have to pay that or they're not paying it and their credit's ruined and so on and so forth so yeah, I've heard too many stories from coworkers, from family members, from, you know, people that I've met along the way in lots of different avenues of this industry. This next part is part of the reason why I left teaching. And I think it just exemplifies or magnifies um, the mindset that the schools have of what's a What's an acceptable wage? Uh, this is despite working full-time hours, the median income for a cosmetologist in America is $26,000. Full-time, that's ridiculous. That's not a living wage. And then I look further down on the website, there's lots of information on here. But the other sad part is that uh, cosmetologists were ranked at or below um, restaurant cooks, janitors, and oh, concierge. For me, when I was teaching and the McDonald's down the street was advertising you could get the same wage starting there, I'm like, this is ridiculous. I, I went to cosmetology school I worked in the industry for almost two decades. I went to school to learn education for cosmetology. So I got my educator's license and all of that is worth <laughs> the same amount as somebody that just, you know, I don't even think you need a high school diploma to work at McDonald's. I mean, not knocking anybody that works at McDonald's, but to compare that to me as an educator felt very, frustrating to say the least and I can't help but express my frustrations when they're there. It's a problem perhaps but I mean the truth is the truth and making the same amount of money as somebody getting hired at McDonald's today like not even somebody who's worked there and is managing and working their way up like I respect that I can understand why we might be you know on the same level they they run the show there okay that makes sense but you're gonna hire somebody in at the same <laughs> I'm sorry it's just like I love teaching so much but I need more than that so yeah I had to keep working behind the chair on top of a full-time schedule teaching so um Yeah, the income thing, it's a kind of a sore subject for me. And I, I think that after you've gone through this education, if the education is of high value, your value should be high. It should not be entry level, you know, no education needed type level income. Like that's ridiculous. So that part to me just never sat well. Like I am a professional. I've worked hard to maintain that excellence. I've kept up with my education. You know, my teacher taught us that we were professionals and we needed to keep up with our education. And these were the things we needed to do. And that's what I wanted to do as an educator too. I wanted to have that level of excellence be high enough that you can make a living. Like my dad, 
when I was, you know, graduating, he's like, I don't know how you're going to make enough money to, um, you know, pay the bills and all this stuff. And then, uh, a couple years into it, he asked me again, like, well, how are you even making any money or something? And at that point, I think it was about four or five years in, I had started making really good money or, you know, pretty decent money. And I told him, I was like, well, I'm making, you know, I think at the time I was making about $20,000 a year working about two days a week, which well, that was 15 years ago. So that was pretty good. But all the girls that I work with that work full time, they're making, you know, over $100,000. And he was like, really? And I was like, yeah, I mean, they're really good at what they do. And they work hard and they earn their money, but they make good money. Just having the knowledge that that's even possible helps you know, you know, what you're striving for. If there's this level of like compliance uh, that this uh, low wage is okay. I don't know who or <laughs> I don't know why they think this is okay. This is not okay. Like we need to fix this. I'm not okay with it. I love my profession too much to let it be downgraded to the same level as something you need no expertise for. It takes so much education to do this well. So there should be a premium for the cost of that you know, knowledge. <laughs> okay, so this is the executive summary of this article. <clears throat> in recent years, policymakers and scholars have focused increasing attention on overly burdensome occupational licensing laws. While much research has examined the cost and benefit of occupational licensing in general, little work has systematically analyzed the experience of people pursuing careers in cosmetology, one of the most widely and erroneously regulated fields for lower income workers. That's true. So this is a lot of people that are affected by this. And I think the more and more the schools are, you know, focused on profit over education, then they're also focused on getting more and more students through faster. And so, yeah, these students are going to become low income cosmetologists because they don't have the education to become, you know, to make it a profession. This study of federal education data, including a deep dive into the large and largely untapped data set of non-degree credential and work experience programs aims to fill that void. So they're trying to um, get out some information here. And this is the justiceinstitute.org. And I will link everything below. So the findings, just an overview, the key findings here. On average, the education required for cosmetology license costs more than $16,000 and takes about a year to complete for students. So that just must be a national average. I would say in my area, it's more like 20 to 40,000. Cosmetology students borrowed over 7,300 on average. Cosmetology programs really rarely graduate students on time, delaying or even blocking them from entering the workforce and increasing their debt because of those overage fees. Um, if aspiring cosmetologists graduate and become licensed, they are frequently upended in jobs where they earn low wages and work long hours with very little time off. And that's a big thing too, is that we're not taking care of these young cosmetologists. There's too many salons out there that are underpaying, overworking, and then they get burnt out and they're like, I'm done. So unless you get into an apprenticeship program, uh, this education is gotten you nowhere if you're done you know within a couple of years because you find out you don't like it but it's just because it's definitely not what you signed up for. Our data also suggests that state license requirements largely explain why cosmetology school takes as long as it does. When states have lowered our requirements cosmetology schools generally follow suit. 
So they're saying the schools just do the bare minimum, which I would say is true. If they don't have to, they're not going to. Personal opinion. Prior research indicates state cosmetology schools requirements bear little relation to public health and safety. The justification for restricting occupational entry through licensing not only to do many of the services cosmetologists provide, such as shampooing, conditioning, blow drying, curling, hairstyling, posing little risk to the public, but average licensing requirement for cosmetologists outstrip those for other occupations that prevent greater inherent risks. Uh, again, I would say that's true. In Michigan, we require that cosmetologists are licensed, but our dental assistants do not need to be licensed. Some are because some states do require that and some dentists do require that. Um, I also had the mindset that, you know, that we should be licensed, that there should be some state regulation because there is some risks involved, mostly with communicable diseases. That's the biggest thing we learn is how to be safe and sanitary, especially when we're using chemicals on people, um, on their skin, you know, so we need to be knowledgeable. So there is, you know, reason to have education. I am so passionate about education. So um, for the example that I brought up, the dental assistant, if like in Michigan, it's not required to have a license as a dental assistant, um, the dentists either train their staff themselves to whatever standard they feel fit, or they acknowledge that having the license does make the dental assistant better trained and they require that despite the fact that the state doesn't. And so um, one of the people that I've followed over the years on YouTube, she is a nail technician um, and nail career education with Susie. Uh, she had said, you know, not everywhere in the world require licensure, but as an educator, I think everyone deserves education. So uh, she really helped me have a different point of view of the licenses in different areas and the requirements. Because just because you're not licensed doesn't mean that you aren't uh, talented or qualified. It Because you might not even need to be licensed where you are. But if you do need to be licensed and you have to go through these hoops, I do see that there is some benefit to it. But over the years that benefit is getting smaller and smaller and they are actually disincentivizing educators who are actually, you know, have have experience. That's the thing too. They don't wanna pay very much for these educators. So they uh, go with very under experienced educators, ones that it really literally went from cos school to, you know, right back to cos school to become an educator, uh, maybe with like a year or two in between, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that per se, but I do think there needs to be people, you know, amongst the group of the staff that have been in the industry for years and years and did do the things they needed to do to build a clientele. They actually did it and they know how it works. And they were, you know, trying different avenues of the industry so they can give a really good full overview of what these students have to look forward to. So we'll go on to the next one now. <laughs> Given the steep costs associated with the with completing the educational requirements for cosmetology licensure, state lawmakers should look hard at whether cosmetology license requirements are justified. Like I said, I've really kind of changed um, <clears throat> my opinion on that. It's really hard to say what the right answer is with that because regulation is good because we don't want a free-for-all but we also if regulation is providing no benefit then you know what's the point at a minimum states should attempt obvious safe niche services and reduce required hours for cosmetology licensure some states have already done this states should also expand the range of setting where haircuts and traditional salon services may be offered this could create opportunities while helping meet the demand for such services at home or outdoors, which have grown in popularity due to COVID. So yeah, with COVID, a lot of things, you know, we've kind of re-evaluated what the right answers are um, as far as safety practices. And, you know, it used to always be, you should be indoors to do all these services because that's more sanitary than being outside, but not necessarily if you need fresh air. <laughs> 
so you're not spreading germs. So yeah, there's lots of other things to consider. And I'm always a big fan of, you know, bringing the data in as it comes. Yeah, as the data comes in, reevaluating and An even better approach would be to consider whether cosmetology licensure is needed at all. As for in food service field, facilities or salon licensures subject to inspection may protect the public just as well as a barrier of occupational entry. So they're saying here, you know, you just have the the establishment get licensed, not the not the people, and the establishment is required to meet the standards and have their staff meet the standards. Um, and the more and more that I've come to terms with the fact that this is not the place. The, the, this is not the industry that I thought it was when I had pursued it for, you know, most of my career. I'm coming to terms with that. I'm mourning that as I wear all black. Yeah, I'm thinking that apprenticeships are probably the way to go. Um, they're saying here that people could feel, still feel free to attend cosmetology schools to build their skills of marketability. And that's kind of what I was saying about dentists still requiring um, their their dental assistants to be licensed even though it's not required by the state because they want them to have that educational experience. And so the same thing with, I think culinary schools the same way, like you can work in a kitchen and cook, but if you go to culinary schools, you're gonna work in a better kitchen and you're gonna be a better cook. So yeah, there's ways that we can make it work where you can still you know, build a career and get the education you need without you know, getting a bunch of people in over their heads with student loans and overage fees that, again, don't produce any income because they're not making a career out of it. So it's a big waste. Introduction. So we're just into the introduction now. Overnight in 2018, hundreds of Minnesotans who made the, a living hairstyling and applying makeup for weddings and proms were forced underground or to go out of business altogether. Their services were safe and popular and have been for years without any issues, but Minnesota State Board of Cosmetology suddenly decided that they needed to be strictly regulated. To do so, the board reinterpreted the state's cosmetology license law to require a license for the first time for on-site hair and makeup for weddings, proms, and other special events. So in Michigan, that is a requirement. Uh, a lot of people don't necessarily follow that requirement, especially makeup artists are really um, well known for not being licensed. Hair, maybe, maybe not. <clears throat> Just to legally style hair and apply makeup, artists would have to become licensed cosmetologists. In Minnesota, the endeavor required spending about a year in cosmetology school and thousands of dollars of tuition. Like I said, about 20 to 40 where I am. Learning how to cut and color hair and provide other services that makeup artists don't do. So. They do have now in Michigan where you can get your esthetician license or your full cosmetology license. And I've always been under the opinion that you should go for the full license if you're going to do it because then you are, again, creating more marketable skills. Uh, so the people who have gone to more of these specialized licenses actually end up even less successful, in my opinion, from my anecdotal evidence that I've seen over the years from friends and family in the industry, people I've worked with, people I went to school with, and so on. Minnesota special event hair and makeup artists were far from the only beauty industry workers required to attend cosmetology school before they can work. For example, nearly a dozen states require full cosmetology license for shampooers. Several states require it even for people who are doing natural braiding. In some recent years, cosmetology license has attracted concern across the ideological spectrum due to the cost it imposes with both workers and consumers. But while much research has been done on the costs and benefits of act occupational licensing in general, little work has been done to systematically analyze the experience of people pursuing cosmetology careers. Study of federal educational data, including a deep dive into large and largely untapped data set and non-degree credentials on work experience programs aims to change that. Key findings are the education requirement for cosmetology license is expensive and time consuming. Cosmetology programs really 
rarely graduate their students on time. And if they do actually become licensed, they are in low wage positions. Our data also suggests that licensure required largely explains why cosmetology school takes as long as it does. State mandated instructional hours vary widely across the states. This study explores the cost associated with completing the educational requirement for a cosmetology licensure and finds they are steep. Given these costs, state lawmakers should take a hard look on whether cosmetologists' requirements are justified and whether they are indeed unnecessarily holding back people trying to enter the field. As an economy require as the economy recovers from the COVID-19 pandemic, removing needless regulatory barriers will help more people get back to productive work more quickly. I would say that's true because a lot of people that are actually really successful in this industry are people that do it on friends and family before they get licensed. And again, like I've been a big, big advocate for licensure in the past on, I think a well done school is worth every penny but when the schools have other uh, ulterior motives and things that aren't as genuine as to what they're providing um yeah then but it's not worth it maybe background cosmetology is a vast and highly regulated industry in the united states in 2019 almost three quarters of a million people were working as cosmetologists nationwide that's a lot of us Every single one of those people needed to be licensed to do their jobs. Cosmetology is licensed by all 50 states and the District of Columbia, but not every country does. So a lot of um, the educators that I've followed over the years are from other countries where things are different. And so I've had to become a little more like accepting of that, you know, that there are, and honestly, a lot of the education that I've gotten over the years has been from people that do their own hair and I'm learning what works for them because I wanna learn about different hair textures. I love that, I love the variety and my hair is very fine and limp. And so I love learning about other hair textures. So I watch the videos, um, a lot of them on YouTube because you can learn so much that way. Okay, requirements for cosmetology lice licensure are not trivial. Previous Institute of Justice research has found the costs of cosmetology is about 386 days and they also require to pass two exams and the fees are about $177 so it would be like your hands-on test and your theory test where it's a written test so that is probably you know every state is different but that's an average and that sounds about right on <clears throat> from my experience in Michigan and because cosmetologists are licensed everywhere in the United States, the occupational rank as fourth of the most widely licensed occupation. Yeah, cosmetologists in the United States are the fourth widely most regulated. Cosmetology licensure education requires impose heavy burdens, far heavier than those on other occupations, far greater relevance to the public health. Yeah, for you know, a lot of people who work in nursing homes, they, <laughs> that's a big one for me that is, especially with the pandemic, you could see how those people were getting very mistreated, of uh, the workers and the people in the nursing home, underpaid, overworked, and yeah, and literally getting sick because of it, because things weren't you know, being done the way they need to be done. There's a lot here and it's not pretty <laughs> and it's sad because it's true.